Afternoon, everybody. And can I just thank the programme organisers for inviting me to come and deliver this talk to you today. There's been some incredible presentations this morning. It's a really hard act to follow. Um, and inspiring, I think, to see and hear the profession represented from so many parts across the globe, which is a challenge for me, being from the north of England. So I'm conscious that I'll have to speak really slowly for you to be able to understand what I'm saying. And I'd like to advocate the addition of the Geordie twang to, uh, to, the, to the voice bank um, discussed earlier today. Um, my role is as part of a team delivering support to those that require long-term ventilation across the northeast and Cumbria. And I've been doing this job for quite a long time, but what's changed over the last couple of years, very recent, is those patients that feel they don't want to continue with treatments that might be life-sustaining. So what I want to share with you today is not a right or a wrong, it's really an experience and something that is evolving and something that I've learned from. And the experience I'm going to share with you today was along with one of my consultant team, Dr. Ben Messer. What I'm gonna briefly and very briefly just go over is the legal stance with regard to withdrawal of mechanical ventilation. I'm going to illustrate that with a case report and then I'm going to share with you what I learned on this occasion and continue to learn um, in the instances that I've been involved subsequent to this one. The GMC remind us that in the context of challenging decision making, those treatments that have the potential to prolong life are the ones that cause us the greatest challenge. And mechanical ventilation definitely falls in to that treatment group. In the context of withholding and withdrawing treatment, we know that the primary aim to starting a treatment is to provide a health benefit to the patient. And the same justification would apply to continuing a treatment already started. But I think in ourselves, <coughs> I think psychologically it might be easier to not start it in the first place than to withdraw it once it's begun. In mechanical ventilation, I think sometimes it feels uncomfortable for us because of the, the short time between stopping the treatment and death. And that makes for us feel like it might be causative. But what we have to remember in this context, the reason that death occurs is because of the underlying disease. Lord Donaldson was a high court, a senior high court judge, and he's quoted as saying, the law requires that an adult patient who is mentally and physically capable of exercising choice must consent if a medical treatment of medical treatment is to be lawful. So consenting for surgery, for example. Treating him without his consent or despite refusal of consent would constitute a civil wrong of trespass to the person and may actually constitute a crime, which isn't something we might think of in the context of, of mechanical ventilation, but you can see how it would apply. I'm going to illustrate those points with this case study. I've got Steve's family's permission and actually they felt very strongly that this should not be anonymized. I think as a uh, demonstration, an acknowledgement to Steve's strength during his illness and throughout the dying process. Um, I have their permission to use both his name and his photographs. Steve was 55 years old and he was diagnosed with motor neuron disease. The diagnosis was at the end of 2012 and this photograph was taken at his son Andrew's wedding at the beginning of that year. The two years that followed, the disease progression was not rapid. But in January of 2015, Steve presented at his regular review in the um, Newcastle Care Centre, the Motor Neuron Disease Care Centre, with those symptoms. So he, at that point, he had lower limb weakness, right upper limb weakness, 
He was presenting at that point with morning headaches, orthopnea. His pulmonary function tests had begun to reduce. He had well-preserved bulbar function. Therefore, NIV was discussed by his lead neurologist and an urgent referral because of the presence of those symptoms with Steve's consent was made for NIV. So that's when I met Steve and he came along with his wife Sharon and I was the one that established the NIV, the treatment with him on that day and I think that first point was critical to the months that followed because what I think is really important is that expectations at the point of treatment initiation have to be outlined to, to the patient and to their family so they know what they can expect to achieve from NIV and it may be something they want to achieve but it actually may not. So Steve consented and we went ahead with treatment but he knew what lay ahead and really very quickly his respiratory muscle function and the disease continued to progress. So by March, April of that year, so literally within two or three months of starting treatment, his dependency on non-invasive ventilation had increased. And by the May of that year, so five months after starting treatment, he was almost completely ventilator dependent on mask ventilation. And the following month, he requested a discussion about withdrawal of treatment and how end of life could be managed. So collaboratively, a meeting was arranged, and again, the MND Care Centre in Newcastle coordinated this. Um, and we all attended. So there was a, a multi-professional group that went out to Steve's home on that day, 20th of July, and had a chat with him. And there'd been a lot of preparation before that. There'd been a lot of discussion with the other health professionals, with the palliative care team, and with the MND team. At that point, Steve was still able to manage a period of ventilator-free breathing. So he wasn't completely dependent and could manage up to about half an hour off the ventilator. He was always, always very clear and articulated that at the meeting, what level of disability he was prepared to tolerate. So he, he knew that he did not want to allow the disease to progress to the point that was fixed in his mind. He was keen to know what the process of withdrawal of ventilation would entail, how it would be managed, how his symptoms would be managed, and exactly how it would be done, who would be there. So we discussed all of that openly with the professional group, Steve, and all of his family present. His capacity had been assessed, and an advanced decision to refuse treatment had been previously discussed outside of, the, uh, of that meeting, but was openly discussed in front of the professional group and recorded. At that point, the personnel who were going to be involved in the withdrawal of ventilation was agreed, and everybody was aware of who to contact when that time came. So when Steve made that decision that he wanted this process to begin, everybody knew who was coordinating and who was gonna take a lead and who was gonna contact everybody. And it was about three weeks later when I received a call from the Macmillan nurse to say that Steve's wife had contacted her to say that he felt his quality of life had deteriorated further to the point that he'd always been very clear about and he with requested withdrawal of NIV. So that was on the 11th of August. The following day was when the process begun, but on that day he was given a stat dose of um, sedation and opiate as a kind of preparation. Um, it actually had very little effect and Steve joked about it. He thought he was going to require a lot more and he was right. So the process really began the day that he requested it, which again I think is a key point. The following day in the afternoon was when we as the home ventilation team attended, but the preparation for that began that morning. So the Macmillan team were, in, were present and they initiated the syringe driver, got the infusions going, got some stat doses in place so that Steve's anxiety and um, level of comfort were already being managed. And what I'm going to walk you through now is what happened over the next two to three days. 
Throughout that day, Steve remained comfortable and settled in his bedroom with his NIV on and his family around him. He did require further stat doses to manage his level of sedation, and by the time we arrived late in the afternoon, he was very settled. We spoke with the family about the events that were about to follow um, and prepared their expectations. This is a scenario that very few people, either professional or lay, would ever be involved with, ourselves included. So we prepared them with what, with what we expected to follow. From a ventilation point of view, for those of you that work in the field of long-term ventilation, these next few points are not critical, but our uh, way of managing the withdrawal of treatment. So initially we reduced the respiratory rate, the backup respiratory rate. And each time we made a reduction of his breathing support, we were observing, checking, and making sure that any signs of agitation or distress were being managed instantly. Because we were there, because the home ventilation team were there, it meant that if there was any sign of distress or agitation, we could immediately increase the level of support from the ventilator until the sedation and the analgesia was rectified, increased, or a stat dose given, and then we'd start again. But actually, we were able to do that, and over the next 45 minutes, we continued to drop not the backup rate, but the inspiratory pressure, which means that the breath size was being reduced and reduced, watching Steve all of the time. By about quarter past six, although Steve was still demonstrating spontaneous breathing, there was no level of arousal or distress. So at that point, the mask, the non-invasive ventilator mask was left on, but the ventilator itself switched off. And the reason for doing that is that if that had to be reversed quickly to then reevaluate the level of sedation, we could do that without the difficulty of getting a mask back on and causing that distress for both Steve and his family. So whilst the mask was in place, all we had to do was reboot up the ventilator, which takes a couple of seconds. That wasn't needed. We observed him for five minutes or so. No signs of respiratory distress, agitation or arousal, so the mask was removed. Our role there that day was to remove the ventilator, not to overall manage his palliation or to manage his symptoms once the ventilator was removed, but the Macmillan team remained in place and managed his symptom control for the hours that followed. So when we left at about 6.30, all of the artificial equipment that Steve no longer wanted to be part of his care was taken away and we left. Steve continued to break some sp spontaneous respiratory effort, actually for another just over 24 hours and passed away with his family around him on the Friday morning. So this was from the Wednesday night to the Friday morning. So reflecting on that, what went well? Well, what went well, in my view, is that Steve decided and had full control over when his treatment should be stopped. And his family have said to me since that he's quoted to have saying, MND is not taking any more of me, and that was him exercising his control. His death was peaceful and dignified, and he had his family around him. That was key for them and for him. He and his family were included in all the discussions and preparations. Communication and coordination between those involved. It won't work if that collaborative approach isn't in place. And in inverted brackets, their dream team. Bizarrely, that's how Steve referred to the home ventilation team in this context, managing his treatment withdrawal, managing his end of life, um, which made me feel that's a demonstration of him feeling that this was how he wanted it done. What did we learn? Learned the unpredictability of MND. I've worked in this field for over 16 years and this always, always takes me by surprise. The practicalities around the arrangements left a feeling within the healthcare team of the situation being engineered. And that felt uncomfortable, but actually, I've had discussions with Steve's family since then, and they saw that 
engineering is a term that you would use for efficiency, for things going well, for things being thought about. So they actually thought this was positive. Another thing that's critical is the time between the decision being made and the plan being implemented. If you have the strength of character as a sufferer of MND to decide that you don't want treatment to continue and that you're approaching end of life, you don't want any delay in that being put into place. So all of the preparation beforehand meant that we could respond immediately. I learned that removing NIV will, always not, will not always result in immediate death. Steve was very weak. He had respiratory muscle weakness many months before that. He was pretty much dependent on non-invasive ventilation. Yet, even with opiate and sedation on board, he still continued to breathe spontaneously. That came as a surprise to me, and that collaboration is key. And just to finish, one thing that's been implemented since um, Steve died last year, this came into play in November at the end of last year, um, from the Associ Association of Palliative Medicine, led by um, Professor Christina Fall. And it's a guideline to manage this situation. And the guideline does two things. It offers guidance, obviously, and reassurance, because anticipatory prescribing is something that, as healthcare professionals, we struggle with. You're treating somebody in the absence of a symptom to treat. The analogy that I always like to use, if those of you that like going to the dentist as much as I do, if he or she offered to wait until you had pain before they gave you that local anaesthetic in your gum, I'm sure none of us would be very thrilled about that. Anticipatory prescribing is common in other fields of practice, and that's all we're doing. We know there's going to be a symptom of breathlessness and anxiety, and we're anticipating that and treating it in advance. And just to finish, the last thing that this guidance does is um, offers a process of data collection. There's an audit form which allows us to submit anonymous data to the team who, have, um, who are organizing this about everything that I've just described to you, the medication use, the timing, the reduction of ventilation, um, the support, the network, the, the professional network involved. Submitting that data means that we will be able to reach a consensus. I've been involved in now about five or six occasions where I've helped a patient make that decision and the, the tec technical support in removing the ventilator. And each time it's different. So us collecting this data and reaching a consensus about how we could manage it will help us provide that absolute gold standard of care that this patient group requires. I want to thank you for listening. Questions? You know I have a question. Um, is there anything in your guidelines or um, have you in your experience about if people can't verbally if, if they're using a communication device to communicate? That's a really good point. And it's um, it, a lot of the presentations earlier today have talked about early intervention in, in you know, one, one scope or another. And this is another necessary um, part that needs that, that, that attention needs to be given because we are working with a disease that renders people or can render people unable to communicate. If they are on non-invasive ventilation, mask ventilation, in my experience over the years, it ceases to be effective and you, you're palliating them and managing them, their symptoms um, even on ventilation. However, I'm sure many of you are now aware and, and you know, we'll see lots of patients on tracheostomy ventilation. So once they lose the ability to communicate that wish, then there is no way that the progression of the disease is, is going to reach an end or may not. So what we try and do is have these discussions, these advanced preparations and the expectations bit that, that at the beginning of this gentleman starting treatment included that. So that that's thought about and decisions are made that can be changed but decisions are made, the discussions are held prior to any loss of communication. Uh, more of a statement than a question, but thank you so much for doing what, in my experience, many doctors <clears throat> and clinicians 
find it difficult to do. Uh, the importance is beyond anything that I can think of. So thank you for that. And the one thing that, excuse me, that you said, uh, that it can look so different, right? You know, sometimes people can have an expectation or many that it should be a certain way. And at the same time, what I appreciate more than anything, because I've witnessed and experienced clinicians sometimes getting in the way of bringing that calm, the guidance and awareness that you bring, and literally shepherding someone through that. So thank you so, so much. It's, thank you. Hi, thank you. Uh, I'm Dan McIntyre. I'm visiting from Boston, Massachusetts. I want to echo what Ron said and, and um, tell you how moving it was, um, the balance that you showed with honoring the family's wishes, but at the same time um, avoiding the, this notion of engineering and letting MND take its natural course. And that's the crux of my question. When you, did you have to talk amongst yourselves and with the family at all about the use of midazolam for agitation, given that one of its side effects is respiratory failure, and and how to avoid the um, pitfalls of that. Yes. Um, so, as part of my role when initiating treatment, I'm try to be as clear as I can that non-invasive ventilation is only one treatment for respiratory distress, and that there are other ways to manage that. So that is a theme that I introduce at a very early stage, um, and that, the, that some of the treatments that reduce respiratory distress will be life extending, and some will not. So yes, that is a conversation that if, if uh, uh, what I would try and do is bring it in at the start of treatment so that you can revisit that at, when this situation arises. Lee Goldman, Switzerland. Thank you very much. You spoke from our hearts, from my colleague and me, because we experienced the same, exactly the same what you did. Yeah. And I um, have a couple of thoughts on that. Um, we get the impression that when patients are on a ventilator, uh, that the actual dying time is very short because the, um, the carbon dioxide is controlled, the, the base in the blood is in a normal level, which make them be able to sleep. And when they're withdrawn, uh, they die very quickly, was our experience. Okay. A ma matter of sometimes minutes, sometimes hours, but never weeks. Yes. We use this argument in our patient training um, education program, which we've been doing for 10 years, in the breathing module, which showed the highest measurement for learning. In, especially in patients and also healthcare, prof healthcare professionals and carers. And uh, we gave those informations as well that that is our professional experience. And for a lot of patients, this was actually the argument to say yes to NIV. And also that the patient can always determine the point of withdrawal. Mm. That is their right to do yeah. and also in a way the obligation, yeah. sort of a moral obligation as well, and that takes a tremendous relief yes. on, on their suffering, on their mental suffering as well in that yes. situation. And um, we had very good experience in that and a lot of people who actually agree to have NIV because of their training program. But on the other hand, there's also a bias because you get the proactive ones. Yeah. Okay, sometimes the ones where the, the relatives push them and then at the end they say, I'm glad I went. Yes, yeah. So, what you said spoke from our heart. Thank you oh, very much. That's very interesting. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. All right, I think we're going to end now. Um, Allison's going to be available, I'm sure, during the break to uh, take questions. Thank you. Thank you.